Recording in progress. Fantastic. So this is week, is it week three, Irene? Only three? Already three? I'm not sure which it is. Anyway, welcome to week three. We're talking about open data. Um, so usual reminders. I'm going to go through them slightly more quickly because I'm going to assume that many of you have seen and heard them by now. We may have breakout rooms in this call. We're not sure yet. Um, if we do, we ask you to choose spoken with S or uh, written breakout rooms with W. Modifying your name in Zoom is the easiest way for us to then sort you into those rooms. We have a code of conduct. Please treat each other with respect um, and all our less spaces, whether that be the Slack, emails um, or these calls. If at any point you feel like you have either experienced or witnessed something that isn't in line with the way people should be behaving, you can um, report that so that we can try and prevent it from happening again by emailing team at openlifesci.org on the etherpad that's line 36 right now, or um, anyone individually, including myself, Movika and Irene on line 37. Uh, you've probably already figured out this call is being recorded. Um, and final reminder um, is transcriptions uh, on the top of the screen where it says Otter AI, click here to open live transcript. It will be catching what I say and what the instructors say. Um, this doesn't happen in breakout rooms, which is part of the reason why we use S and W for those breakout rooms. Um, hopefully that was a bit faster than normal. Irena, you want to take up the next section? Yes, thank you, Joe. So. We will do a short recap, and for that, I'm going to share my screen. Can you see that now? Yes. So again, we are um, in week three, and this week we're going to cover open data. So we have started the program covering the uh, ethos of open science, that is uh, an introduction to open science, what is the essence of open science. Um, and last week we covered a module of open tools and resources. And for that, we learned how to assemble different open strategies from the beginning of the research process um, until the end. So that is open data, open results, um, open code as well. And Japsia gave us a quick overview of how that looks like um, just in general terms. And then we also started learning about general tools for open science, that is uh, metadata, documentation, repositories, and persistent identifiers. So this week uh, with Sarah and uh, Pauline in, on Thursday, we're gonna dive into open data. So we're gonna learn about um, how those general tools for open science apply specifically for open data. And today uh, we're gonna see an introduction to open data and an introduction to fair principles, which Sarah will explain what that means. Um, so that's an overview of where we are in the program. I'm gonna stop sharing and we want to start with a short activity first. So, let me share a link. Um, we want to ask you to take a few minutes, maybe three to five minutes, to share with us uh, feedback about your experience in the program so far. So there is, we have a link to uh, Google Forums. This is anonymous, and we have, I think, three or four quick questions. And what we want to learn is, what has worked well so far in terms of the format for the training sessions? What are things that maybe we can improve? And some things that you have learned so far. What has stand um, what has uh, um, stand up to you so far in the program? That will help us improve and change and adapt um, the second half of the program. So please just take a few minutes to, to do that. Um, I'm gonna just give you time for that. Please let me know if hmm, you need permission for that. Can you, can someone else confirm if they can access the Google form? Okay, let me, let me look into that. I think,
Um, I'm looking at my file here and it's not really accepting responses. So let me reshare the link. I'm not sure what's happening. Joe, do you have any idea what could be happening? I am um, no. <laughs> uh, oh, I have a feeling. What if I click send? Um, hmm. I make it easy, internet. Computers. It's not like um, I used to be a programmer or anything. Who knows how, how computers work? <laughs> Bear with us one moment, my friends. Or optionally, do we want um, maybe if we ask Sarah to take things over, then we can troubleshoot in the background? Yeah. Yep. Happy to do that. Uh, we can always just like try also in the breakout time uh, if you guys want. Okay, so I'll try to share my presentation. Uh, 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 there I am. Wonderful. Can you all see my screen? Hopefully. Cool. Perfect. Okay, so here we are. Um, so hi everyone. I'm super excited to be here with you. My name is Sara. I'm a researcher at Kidding's College London, though I'm presently now uh, uh, in Spain, my hometown, as you can tell by my accent. Um, I'm a molecular scientist by training. But I've been a, a mentor at the Open Seeds, uh, which is a training program for OLS for already three years now, and also contributor of the Turing Way, which you will see that uh, is a community and a guide for reproducible and open science uh, that has heavily impacted this presentation as well. Um, I will have, so basically what, uh, like Irene has already said, but basically I'm, my aim is try to keep this program and this uh, session quite uh, simple in the sense that I just want to give an introduction to open data and make you guys think a bit, a bit about uh, open data barriers and efforts that we should all be making in our lives and in our work maybe, uh, have a bit of a breakout discussion time and then jump into fair principles and fair data. And uh, again, reflect a bit on about how we can impact this uh, in our work. And then happy to take questions during the breakout times, even at the end, we will have some time as well for questions. Like basically don't feel shy, uh, feel free to drop any question also in the chat, in the notepad. Uh, and during the discussion time, again, uh, don't be shy. We can always like talk. I want to keep things as interactive as possible. So just to begin with, uh, what is data? Because we all talk about uh, open data, open science, all of these things, and not everybody knows or works with data as it is. Uh, I'm going to keep things a bit to the size of like science and research, but it should all be quite applicable at least uh, to your fields, even if you don't work in those exact fields. Yeah, again, any doubts, just let me know. But basically what we say, what we mean about data is uh, any type of information that is data, any type of information that can be collected, observed, created. Again, in this uh, presentation, I'm basically, I'm basing things a bit in the context of research, but it doesn't even have to be like that. Um, basically it's anything and everything that you need to validate or reproduce for again, your research findings, but also what is required for the understanding and handling of the data itself. So the data uh, can be different types and what we can call a primary data will be the raw from measurements or instruments. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be a research per se. It can be just like you have a, a sensor in your construction site uh, that's sending you raw data, primary data. 
uh, what you do with that data from those sensors, uh, and how you process it, the maths, the calculations, that would be the secondary data. And then um, the, the data that you published in your reports, that would be your published data. And then when we talk about the data about your data, so time collected, person who has collected it, a version of the data, things like that, is what we call metadata, yeah? So, uh, apologies, yeah. So why are we talking so much about open data, yeah? So open data, again, what it is, is data that came, that it's what we refer to uh, data that is, uh, the, the data that can be freely reused, used, and redistributed by anyone. Why is this important? Because in the end, there's a lot of money put uh, and invested in getting that data and creating the data in using that data that is really not properly used when that data is closed, when we cannot reuse that data. Why spend uh, another million of pounds in uh, creating some data set when you can already reuse some data set that ha probably has the same information around? Also, these last years, we've been talking about the reproducibility uh, crisis, again, a bit uh, more towards research, but I think it cannot be applied to other fields. Um, open data usually tends to be a bit more reliable because what we will discuss later about fair, num uh, fair principles, and basically it allows people to reduce it and uh, indeed think about what is happening there. So just... There's tons of reasons basically about why working with open data, why making your data open. But number one is it really helps to make science more reproducible, more accessible, especially, uh, especially when it fits uh, researchers in the South where uh, the, the opportunities are really not the same. Uh, again, as I just said, like there's less wasted grant money. Why, why are we going to reinvent the wheel if there is already a really nice wheel out there? And also it can pose a career boost. Think, people think sometimes that open data is against uh, promotions. Uh, I think this is more an academia mindset, but it can happen in other places. Um, but, uh, but indeed, if you think about it correctly, the more you can cite your data with the correct license, so you have uh, the ownership, let's say, uh, let's say of that data, the more it will go everywhere, the more people will know you and the more it will boost your career. So there's, I really like this uh, five, oh, uh, apologies. I really like this, like this five star point about how to make uh, open data. Uh, again, just to keep th things very simple. So there's things that really almost everyone can do, which is just like, make your data available on the web. That's it, whatever format, just leave it out there. Yeah, um, under the open license and open license that will allow people to be uh, to use your data. Extra point, if you make it available as structured data. Yeah, so instead of just using an image scan of a table, you upload the table, ex uh, the Excel table per se. Third extra point, if you make that table in a non-proprietary open format, so a CSV file instead instead of Excel, yeah? Um, another extra point for you, if you make, uh, if you use OERIs to denote uh, things, some people can actually point at your data, at your stuff uh, uh, out there. And then um, uh, 10 out of 10 mark, would go if you can actually link your data to other data to provide context, yeah? So cite your data, but also cite other people's uh, data out there. So the first exercise that I wanted to pose you uh, is just to make you think, yeah? So having this, uh, these points in, my, in your mind, what are the barriers that you think are out there to open data? Yeah, uh, so we would like you um, to discuss this, but also like if you can write it in the notepad. Uh, again, if you can just think, so the, the question would be, yeah, like what is what is stopping you from 
from using, from adopting, from uh, enabling open data at your work, uh, in your field, or or just even if it doesn't apply to you, uh, what have you seen that is stopping people? Yeah, it doesn't have to get even personal. And again, extra point if you can also think about a so uh, uh, about a solution to that specific uh, barrier. Yeah. Uh, so I think we can allow for 10 minutes for this and then we can come back and discuss it, all the barriers that you can, we can see. Does that sound good? Yeah, so Sarah, I have um, shared the link to the line on the pad where the activity is. So that's line 71. And there you can see a space where you can uh, share your name and your answer to the prompts that Sarah is suggesting here. And we're gonna leave um, some time for silent reflection and exercise, and then come back to uh, discuss, this, discuss that with Sarah.
Just a reminder that there are extra points if you actually think about a solution to your <laughs> barrier as well, yeah? <laughs> if you can come up with one, yeah. Sometimes it's quite difficult. But I'm really liking what I'm seeing. Thanks a lot, guys. So I'm starting to see that the writing is slowing down, uh, but there are so many great answers. Sarah, do you want to uh, continue yes. the discussion? Yes, let's go with them. Yeah, first of all, before I start going through them and uh, maybe discussing them, is anyone who wants to uh, actually explain their barriers or their contribution aloud? Uh, just in case I misinterpret or do something, like feel free to speak up. If not, I'll do my best to uh, go through your things. Okay, so I'll just go through some of them. Yes, but I, for what I'm seeing, they are very good uh, reasons. So one that I really like is the best first one, actually, lack of technical skills in data management and sharing. So that is for sure uh, a barrier. I would argue that uh, the main solution to that one is, uh, well, uh, training and uh, learning, as we have to do, I think, in most of our uh, fields and work in life. Um, also, for the basic things, like the five-star list that I just shared, I would really think, uh, like, Almost everyone, I mean, if you guys have managed to make it to a Zoom call, I'm sure that you can really manage to just upload it uh, to some um, um, like uh, data management site. Uh, I mean, there we will discuss a bit uh, later about data management plans. For that, of course, there we will need to learn and get some more skills. But I think there are very basic things that we could all be doing out there. Um, in the terms, I really like the <laughs> this discussion that has been here about peer review. Again, I, I I totally agree. I don't think peer review is actually a barrier. I think that's more or less, it's more of a mindset, let's say. Um, so we do tend to think that because a paper is there out there published in a super high impact paper or even not a high impact paper, that it's already a super reproducible paper or it, that is just the, the truth. First of all, I would like to remind everyone that this is science. So even if it's the most reproducible paper in the world, that doesn't uh, mean that in 10 years we discover something else and that probably is not true anymore. What we want is uh, some the results and that, that a data interpretable that uh, makes us say what we are seeing and what can, we can interpret at that time with the data that we have. Peer review definitely helps sometimes. Of course, it's science, so we all could benefit from having different uh, points of view and from being defied, and from having corroboration from things. But for me, for example, uh, more than a peer review, what is more valid is having several papers published uh, about the same result. So again, reproducibility. When something has been found several times, even in different matters, or even more if in different ways and different matters, that makes an argument and a data and a conclusion stronger than any peer review and any nature publication uh, in the world. And I really like the yeah the explanation about that peer review didn't really stop the autism vaccine uh, paper to go there. 
Uh, privacy is a good one, a very good one. I don't have the solution about being a barrier per se. We will talk about it a bit later. Um, you can definitely do things to even keep private data a bit more open. So we can we will discuss it a bit later, but of course you can anonymize, anonymize the data. You can just maybe make open the, the conclusions that you have about that data, even if it is private. When we say private data, I am assuming, but I might not be right, about, for example, sensitive data about people's uh, names, conditions, uh, healthcare data, things like that. That is very sensitive and has to be definitely managed in a different way. But again, there are ways to manage that in a more open uh, way and a more reproducible way that how it's currently done, or at least in some fields. Um, let me go through those things. Again, cost of open access publishing, going back to publishing systems. So this is cost of open access publishing. I totally agree with this uh, reason again. Uh, one way to do that, for example, would be just making your data available in uh, free uh, and public uh, sites. Um, so in, for, I do work more in biology and healthcare, so we have BioArchive. You do have also other repositories like Senodo, like OSF, where you can actually upload manuscripts. You can even discuss those manuscripts and have peer review in those manuscripts. Uh, so like that's not really a, a barrier. I'm agree of the current system, and I know that that doesn't count for a lot of funders. So I do see the barrier to the solution. Uh, but again, this the, there won't be a unique solution and there won't be a unique way to work in open science and with open data. I think it's a, um, a, yeah, a community of little solutions and little steps uh, that we all have to uh, adopt. Some might be easier to adopt depending on your work and your field, things like that. I really like the, again, time and resources to organize the data, to make it available. I think this will have the solution when we go through the data management plans. So the main solution for this is that, is just to think in advance what you are going to do with your data, how are you going to uh, collect the data, so that way you have the resources to organize that data, to make it available, and that is already uh, thought in advance. Like you would do for your project, for an, without data, how do you, you Hopefully, we all use project management tools in a way or another. So the way, the same way that you organize and manage people, and that you organize your workload. So this works the same way for data. You just have to think a bit in advance and plan what you are going to do with those things. Um, what else do we have here? Theft of data. Uh, if uh, again, uh, if this is the, if this means like representing your data as their own. So the main solution here would be publish your data, publish it, of course, with your name, and then license it. So then you can always have an open license or a bit more closer license, but people should really credit your work, even if it is an open license that anybody can, uh, that means that um, anybody can use your data. Um more privacy concerns, things like that. Uh, lack of manpower to manage data. Again, so agree with this. Uh, the solution, extra point for you, Denise, would be yeah, having more resources needed to hire data management manager. I agree. Uh, that shouldn't stop us from doing our part, which is manage the bits that we can. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it is not that easy, and sometimes we have the time, sometimes we don't. Uh, but as I said, I think there's just like little grains that we can just start adding um, for our, our things. And just one last one that I also wanted to mention, the open science lacks measurements for impact factor of research or H index. Again, I think we have to really, it's a matter of mindset. So I know that these things, currently nowadays do import like do matter in terms of funding but like i don't know if you guys are aware about the dora um uh, the dora declaration uh, which is really um uh a way of trying to step out of this impact factor uh, madness that as the 
current publishing system is now is not really useful for anyone. Uh, yeah, Priya, you have your hand raised. Do you want to comment comment on anything? Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. Uh, I wanted to raise a concern about one particular thing that I came across. Yes. Uh, maybe it's part of solution as well. For example, uh, one of the uh, key instruments for material science, uh, it is being used uh, by both physicists, chemists, chemists and uh, material scientists, or even in other um, backgrounds as well. But what happens is um, sometimes the data that is being published uh, sometime of say 1980s, it is taken over years and it is misinterpreted after 20 years over evolution of something explained from one point to a whole different thing. And this was one of the key um, um, issue that has been discussed by for using that particular instrument. And as a community, researchers came across who are experts in the field uh, to uh, inform fellow researchers from all fields, like saying what are the do's and don'ts when you are using the system and how you are assessing that material. Uh, this is for one particular equipment. And likewise, there are many complicated systems that are being used nowadays, even though it is not the main area of their research. And now being open data is uh, widely spoken about and widely implemented. This is also something uh, that needs to be um, kept in mind when we share data, like how we are analyzing, uh, how we are uh, telling other people to make use of the data that we are sharing, which because after a few years, it turns into some a, a whole different picture of what has been initially told. Uh, so I think this is something uh, that we need to keep in mind when we implement open data. Yes, thank you for that. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. And then, uh, yeah, again, so I'm, I'm mostly focusing everything today about data per se, but I would, I think that anything in this presentation can also be data and software, data and analysis. So like it goes with everything. And and regarding the interpretation and the analysis in your part, I do agree. I, in my in my field, for example, I I find that it's even more useful than having the data. I mean that I give it as a must. Uh, but like having, for example, yeah, the notebooks uh of analysis of code that people have used to then get the um, the interpreted data as well so yeah i totally agree with you yeah thank you so much okay so um so i think we're going to close the discussion by now for now um i had a bit of uh oh, let me just going back to my presentation here yeah, I think you cannot see it now. Um, thanks, Yo. <laughs> so yeah, I had here just a bit of uh, a mini list of barriers in case you guys weren't as inspired as you have turned to be. Uh, so again, I all totally agree the extra work and uh, that there might be like too many choices of ways how to do it, what tools to use, uh, things like that. So I for sure did uh, feel quite overwhelmed when I started in this open science world, open data about what should I use, what project management tool or which language to code or things like that. So I would encourage just that go for what is just really field specific or what is like the people that you trust that what, the, what are they using. Um, again, the publication bias, uh, not that much about uh, peer review, but also like that we can really uh, publish negative data as well and make it citable, very useful. And as you can see here, I already had the, the privacy data. Not going, I'm not definitely an expert on this, and I think you guys have more discussion about this in other uh, sessions, but just wanted to point that, of course, that uh, when treating with private data, people definitely do deserve dignity, they, they do need agency, they do need to have their privacy rights 
uh, there uh, and empowered and enabled. And we definitely always have to work with consent and confirm consent. This as a must, as a minimum, bare minimum. Then again, uh, there are other ways to talk, not other ways, like there are ways to actually work with private data and, pri and work with private data in an open way. Uh, again, not going to go to the specifics of that, but just think about, again, some minimum, bare minimum, which is like anonymizing data, randomized data. Uh, just think about not even like sharing the raw data, but sharing the analyzed data, uh, things like that. Uh, but again, this should always go via uh, consents, privacy rights, ethics, uh, and all the bureaucracy that is really needed and really helpful to treat with this kind of data. Um, so just closing a bit the introduction to open data, I'm going to jump straight to the FIRE principles. Uh, uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't. I definitely didn't know what they were like some years ago. Uh, what was fair principles and fair is not just because they are fair, it's because it stands for findable, accessible, uh, interoperable and reusable data or principles. So fair principles, fair is not just, yeah, it's a principle, yeah, so it's not rules, it's not a standard. It's a, a set of principles to define best, best practices for both data and software. And uh, the idea is that it would, it would really facilitate, it will help discovery, access, and reuse by both humans and machines. So we, in the end, there's a lot of uh, automatization, automatization and making things a bit easier for both uh, our minds and uh, use of machines. So again, this is just a way to empower us to make things easier and better. If it's not easier, if it's not making things better, then it's not working, it's not uh, within the fair set of principles. So when we say findable, it's really that you can find the data. That's it, as easy as that. And it does sound easy, but sometimes it is not. It's been like countless of times that I've checked on a paper, please go set uh, to find this data and then I click on set and then redirect me to why and then I go to why and then it's just lost. I don't know where to find this data set. Or I go uh, to my or uh, to my old lab book from 10 years ago, Sarah, when I didn't know what I was doing and I wanted to see where I had put my data and I couldn't even find the folder. It is as easy as that. Accessible, that it is like that, yeah, accessible by others, interoperable, that we can use it in different formats and reusable, as it, as you can see, reusable by others, but also by your future you. So I'm going to go a bit in um, yeah, uh, detail with this. Uh, again, it might be a bit of, I don't know, common sense, but I, I feel like sometimes it's not really known how, how to do things. So like, again, like findable is basically your data has to be discovered by others. It doesn't matter that you know where it was. Your lab mate has to know where it was. Your engineer in the other side of the table needs to know where it is. And, um, and this can be just with having like very rich metadata. So like, you know, the, the time points where your sensors receive the data, but you also know the date. Yeah, so things as easy as the name of the file, the date. Things like that can be just like very uh, uh, in a context and consensus. Uh, a way to do it, so current enable tech that you can use to do uh, this kind, your data findable is this data set metadata uh, schema. You can also use, I think you've, uh, you've been uh, shown how to do it before, like persistent identifiers. So in the case of digital data sets, manuscripts, things like that, you can, uh, implement a, a digital object identifier, DOI, or uh, in the sense of contributors, so to make your data uh, citable and to make sure that you are not being, uh, that you there's no theft of data, you can use ORCID. Uh, so it's a, a code that uniquely uh, identifies authors and the contributors of a research in question. So to make things uh, accessible, it means that your data can really be available to others 
So the way to do this, again, like you can just share it, uh, FTP, HTTP. So basically upload it all out there and uh, that the protocol to use it is open, it's free. You don't have to pay uh, any journal, things like that. So you can really just uh, put your data and metadata because again, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if you just upload your data, if it doesn't have the correct metadata attached to it, uh, people won't be able to interpret it. So you can just like upload it to a repository. Again, interoperable, this was a more difficult one for me. And uh, that's why I like to summarize in like, your data can really be integrated with other data and can be used by other machines. So for this, I think this is a very mindset thing because it's quite easy to do, but it really makes you change your ways to work because you really need to use a standardized format. You really need to use vocabulary and words that follow fair principles. You really need to use your metadata. Uh, so in the beginning, it does take a bit, but it really pays forward. So again, uh, ways to do this is just using uh, yes, yeah, Zenodo, other uh, so they like basically repositories that uh, use schemas and other vocabularies that are just check and that they are context uh, related. And then to finish, um, the that your data is reusable. That's quite easy to to know about. Like your data can be reused by others. And for this, it's just like, okay, let's just upload things. Again, uh, I think the key fact in here is that you release your data, you uploaded your data, but the key thing here would be that it is released with a clear and accessible data usage land license. Yeah, it has to be also detailed in the sense that the data has to be associated with the detailed provenance. Where has it, how has it been created? Where has it been? What has happened to it? And then uh, again, like uh, repositories like data sites and Odo, uh, it does help to uh, upload metadata and make things reusable. Again, the key thing, I'm just insisting on this because uh, it also took me a while to, I don't know, uh, embrace, embrace it in the sense of process it. It doesn't matter that you just upload it. You have to upload it with an, a clear and accessible license. If there's no license, there's no access, yeah? So you really need to make sure that you say, okay, I'm uploading this data and this I'm giving this data this type of license. So this is just like a very uh, simple, quick table. You can check, I think you'll have more license uh, uh, course uh, later, but if not, like there are a lot of uh, resources there. And I think I'm quoting also some of them at the end of the presentation, but um, yeah, like a license, like a, yeah, by like very useful like attribution, like by uh, you really need to credit the creator, the title, and the license of the work is under uh, non-commercial. Like really, you can just not use it for commercial purpose, uh, things like that. Yeah. Uh, so the license is, again, very, very important because it doesn't matter if you put it out there, but people don't know what to do with the data, with the data set, with the software, uh, then it's like, it doesn't matter, yeah, that you just released it. So another point that I wanted to make is that fair data doesn't necessarily mean open data. So there are two separate things. Both, of course, are ideal, but they are not the same thing. So closed data can definitely be fair. Um, in the sense, for example, of sensitive data, private data, as I said, like maybe you have to really keep it private, but you can definitely make it fair um, and make it, for example, searchable in a limited access database. So you won't be uh, opening your healthcare records of your patients to any, everyone, but maybe you can open it to the consortium of research that you are working with or to the doctors in a specific hospital, things like that. An open data can be not fair. So if I, uh, as I just said, I open all my data, I publish it, but it's totally undocumented. It doesn't have metadata associated. It doesn't have a license or the correct license as associated. It, then it's not fair. Yeah. So uh, the two things are definitely desirable, but they, it doesn't mean that you're doing both. So the fair, I really like this, that uh, fair data motto, as a, that you can, you just have to be, 
and use your data as open as possible, but as close as necessary. So again, just to keep a bit of that privacy matter uh, in there. So then how to apply fair principles? I think the key would be data management plans. Yeah, so as I said, the same way that when you start a project, you do a project, a project management plan and you uh, think about the steps in advance. And then, of course, depending on which workflow you, you use, then you can go uh, back and forth or just correct it or however you work that I, I'm not dealing with that. I'm just saying that you plan things in advance and then you work through them. So this is the same with data. So um, I really like this um, um, this picture of Scriberia, like because it this is the instance where you really acknowledge having making the effort of a, a data management plan when think bad things happen basically when your computer crash and you lose all the data or you share things things like that is uh, that is when you really um, embrace the power of having a data management plan. So just again, I'm going very going over very briefly through this. Um, uh, happy to discuss it further, but just to 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 point out that a good management management plan, there it has six points that just should really be there, uh, which is like the roles of responsibilities: who is going to uh, collect the data, who is going to analyze the data, who is going to make sure that the data is being backed up and storage. And start. Um, another thing that has to be in a good plan is like the type, like description of the type and the size of the data collected. Again, the documentation and the metadata. How are we going to generate it? How are we going to keep up with it? The type of data storage used and backup. So one of the barriers that has been uh, mentioned was uh, uh, regarding this. Um, where are we going to store uh, our data? Uh, who is going to manage it? Things like that. Again, the preservation of these research outputs. Again, just cross the word research if you don't work in research. The preservation of the data after the project has finished. How long are we going to keep the data if we are going to ever destroy it? Uh, how to make it like more green? Reuse of the research outputs by others, and of course the costs. Uh, we don't work in an ideal world where everything is free. So these are the things that you really need to plan in advance so you don't suffer through all these things uh, during or after your project. Um, I also really like this scheme about the may use, make, share. So again, as you can see, um, in through the make, the create a management plan is the base yeah, so you can really not start creating data and making data without a good uh, management plan. And then this would allow to use and share uh, because you have already done like a very nice uh, job, like assigning licenses, identifiers, and things like that. So just to finish a bit uh, with another uh, exercise and discussion time, um, again, because I know that any, and not everything is like ideal and perfect in this world, I would really like to hear from you guys like examples when data is not fair and how could it be fixed? If it can be fixed, again, sometimes it just cannot because whatever, I would really like to hear from you. So if uh, you can think and share your thoughts in the shared doc, and then I would really, again, uh, love to hear from you if you want to uh, let us know uh, later in the room. Uh, do you think we have uh, a couple of minutes for questions? Yes, yes, of course, definitely. Yeah, I just have a wrap up, a couple of wrap up um, slides after this. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, because I'm seeing some comments in the in the chat. Uh, yes. Anna was uh, sharing um, that about private private data. Uh, oh, yes. That the comment says, I think people deserve personal security too, because some open data can provoke risk. Uh, for example, there are indigenous people self declared LGBT. Um, and if open data show their locations, they can be put at risk. So I'm again wondering. Yeah, yeah so... no, just to comment on this, because I think it's very, very important point. Uh, open data doesn't mean that you share everything. As I just said, so I really want to make this clear, yeah? 
open data means so I really so going or going back to the uh, fair data moto. Yeah, let's let's just if I if you if I can make any take home message, probably it would be this one, the fair data moto. Just make your data as open as possible and as close as necessary. Yeah, so I think that would be my take home message, because sometimes, as you just said, Anna, it's just not possible to make it to make certain things open or it shouldn't, even if it is possible, it shouldn't be open. Yes, so we have to make things as closed as necessary. In the case of, yes, of uh, LGTB locations, anything, it's just like anything, like some things are just not there to be uh, out there. Or, you, or again, it's just like people's, even if it's just like a name or whatever, if it is not something that is very risky or touchy, like some things, you just need to have people's consent and that's it. It doesn't matter if it is just like, what is their favorite food uh, data? If you don't have their consent to share, you just don't share. That's it. Yeah, so I really want to make this clear. I'm not encouraging people to open and to publish any data that they have. And if it is regarding people's data, you really need to have consent. You really need to follow privacy rights. You really need to follow ethics. So I, I, I really want to make that clear. Um, and this is the kind of things that would be or should make you think about the rules and all of this when you encounter or when you start planning a, a data management plan. Uh, so you would go through all these uh, rights, laws and things like that uh, when working with privacy data, for example. Joe, do you have a question, a comment? You know me, it's always going to be a comment, not a question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just actually just wanted to share uh, about my own research um, because I um, I'm a computer science researcher, but most of my research um, has been interviews and surveys, um, and very often it's been about things like open data. Um, but if you're interviewing and asking someone about open data, they could be talking about times when data shouldn't have been open, or when they disagree with policies. Um, that is, this might be things that put them at risk for losing their job. So by by default, no, by design, remembering open by design and open by default, by design, I do not share things, including transcripts of very sensitive things, even when it's anonymized, because as we've noted, anonymous isn't real, right? It's too often there's something that you just don't realize that is too easy to out someone in some way um, and so being thoughtful about the design of your study and whether or not you're sharing things and why you're not sharing it there's just so many reasons why it might be um, I, I think it's just good perhaps to lean back into open by design is one of my favorite favorite phrases <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for sharing that, Joe. Um, well, so yeah, coming back, if you want to uh, yeah, share your experiences, your uh, reasons, uh, anything that you can think again about or what you've seen uh, about making data not fair or when to make it fair. Um, basically, any thoughts that you have about fair data, would really love <laughs> to keep discussing with you guys. Um there's a, yeah, a dedicated line in the doc. Not sure which one, let me check. So um, we're on line um, 136. Thank you. <laughs> so do you want us to stay on the main room? Um, up to you, to be honest. Yeah, probably better. Uh, so I think people can write their experiences as well. And if they want to share out loud, uh, then we can do the same later. Sorry, Irene, I think I was editing at the same time as you. And... Too many cooks spoil the broth, as they say. <laughs> no, that's okay. So on, line, on that line that I put the link to, um, there is a 
a space for you to share your answers, just like we, you shared your answers in the previous activity. So uh, the question is, can you think of examples when data is not fair? You know, so please share your examples. I think this discussion of private data is already a starting point and you can continue the discussion there. Um, yes, yeah, Samira is sharing also some, some comments in the chat. Um, so we'll take a few minutes to let everyone um, share some examples and then we'll come back to this to the discussion can i can i ask you something <laughs> thank you um i i work with human rights uh, i am a human rights researcher and last year uh, we were trying i was working for brazilian government and we were trying to to uh, to separate what are open data what are not in in so in human rights uh, it's very complicated and um, uh, but I, I'll, I will ask you because I don't know if it's if it's correct my um, uh, what I'm thinking uh, in, for human rights are not fair data it's a not disaggregated data that does not consider for example gender, uh, uh, sex, uh, race. It, it, is it correct to say or not? It's so specific. Your question if is is if it is correct to say that it is fair data or yes, because for me, for example, uh, for human rights research, uh, it's not a. Uh, it's not uh, reusable nowadays. For example, ten people uh, were were killed by the police in Brazil. Uh, but we need uh, gender, we need sex, we need race, we need the location. Uh, so, so it's a question. Uh, can I say that are not disaggregated data uh, in human rights? It, it's not. It's not fair. So again, uh, like the fair, it again, it's just a set of principles. Yeah, it's not a uh, compulsory. It's not a uh, standards. It's, um, and I would really encourage yeah to give, go back to like, just go to as close as open as possible, as close as necessary. Mm -hmm. Of course, not data is not all the data is there to be reused, as you just said. Like yeah, of course, uh, if you have data about people that are really not there to be open and not to be reused. Yes, of course, that's it. So I would make me phrased, like we've made this data as fair as possible, mm -hmm. maybe. Uh, again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in that specific field, yeah? So, uh, so I would definitely, the steps I would follow, for example, from my side would be review the, the legislation, uh, review your ethics approvals. If you got, like I'm, I am assuming that you probably got some ethic approval uh, to collect the data. Uh, so probably it should be there pointed out what, how you can call it, what you can do with it. And then just, as I said, like some data is just there not to be shared. It's just to, 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 to the data is collected to hopefully answer a question, provide a solution. Sometimes we can uh, open and share the raw data for others to reuse. Sometimes we just simply cannot, and, and that's fine too. Uh, okay, As, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm just going to go back to the prompts, the answer. Oh, I really like one of these ones. Uh, I'm doing, <laughs> yo, I'm seeing you laugh. <laughs> um, okay, yeah. I mean, I don't have the solutions to all of this. <laughs> yeah, I just like to see all the problems that are out there. Um, so I totally agree the frustration with like there when there is so much data not organized that it becomes inaccessible. Definitely. So that would be an example of not fair data. Uh, as I said, like if you have a good data management plan, it should allow you to 
um, properly manage and organize your data so it is at least uh, accessible. Uh, yes, exactly, Yo. Uh, so that would, it wouldn't be fair because it is not findable, basically. Um, going back to that, uh, when, yeah, the data shared uh, is in a format that requires a proprietary software on tool or when you find it yourself locked. So again, it doesn't follow the interoperable um, rule or principle. Um, proprietary file, file format, it is there again, yeah. Um, data share that doesn't provide enough information for operating on analyzing the data with the same precision. So again, it doesn't have the same metadata or, or the, the accurate metadata file. Let's say uh, that wouldn't make it reusable, wouldn't make it in, in interoperable at all. Um, Sometimes uh, this is a truth story. I've clicked on the link for sequencing data, went to actually download the data, could download the data. It wasn't even properly named. I didn't know which samples I was checking, uh, which were like A and which ones were B. So I just had like totally useless data uh, there for me. Um, which again, I think that goes with what is in uh, line 155 in situations when data is stored on personal devices without being indexed, indexed or shared. It is not findable. Um, I really, yeah, this is a perfect summary. Uh, thanks for whoever wrote line 155. Yeah, so if data is locked behind paywalls, not accessible. Uh, if it is safe in a unique format without the standardization, it's not interoperable. This is just the perfect summary. Uh, and if there is insufficient documentation or there are, there are no good license, uh, it is not reusable. Um, so yeah, I think these are more or less all of them. Thank you so much for all of this. I don't know if anyone has more questions or more examples, or do you want to say anything else? If not, I'll... I have a question. Yeah, sorry, go for it. Okay, okay. We are talking about open data, but we have not mentioned, not once, we have not mentioned um, AI. And I want to say that when you make an AI model, train it with existing data, and when you outsource it or you open it through platforms like ChatGPT, people can have access to it just by asking questions or prompts. But often it doesn't mention the source of the data, for instance. It doesn't tell you where it got the data from unless you explicitly ask him to do that. Does that make it unfair, the data from AI? The question is, is AI data fair or not? That's my question, thank you. It is a great question. I literally just went to a workshop on responsible AI uh, with that same question last week. And what I took, I'm not an AI expert at all, uh, but what I took from that responsible AI workshop is that it really depends on the AI and that uh, the, main, so the main answer would be no. Uh, a lot of AI models are not fair in the sense that as you just highlighted, they are not detailing the provenance of the data, or also like they are not, I think the problem with AI is that it is such a current problem, is that uh, there are no proper laws and regulations also in place to make think, people uh, think about the fair principles and make them, for example, uh, put ethics in place, um, things like that. So I guess if it would be a really fair AI, as we have just seen, they would highlight where have they got their data pro from, uh, if that data actually is open for others to use or not, uh, the metadata uh, associated to that. So follow all this list uh, and that probably the software, the code behind that, behind that uh, specific AI model, uh, who has created, who has written it, things like that. Uh, so as I said, I'm, I'm not an expert. I, I I don't think that is a common practice, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but I think those things will come with regulations, hopefully. I don't know. I'm a hopeful person. Okay, thank you. 
But thank you for the question. I think it's very interesting. As I said, like uh, in this uh, workshop, it was uh, I was more participating in the reproducibility part, uh, but all the AI experts in that workshop, they were basically all mulling over the same thing. Like, what are we going to do to take care of, again, like private data, coming back to the privacy issue, uh, ethics, all of those things. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a current problem without solution yet. Um, okay, so basically I just wanted, I just have one last slide uh, to finish. Uh, sorry to interrupt. We yeah. have another question in yes. the chat uh, related to AI and data. And Ahmed asks how to deal with um, synthetic data generation. Yeah, that is a good question too. <laughs> Um, uh, I don't have that answer, I'm afraid, as I said. I'm not uh, an AI expert. Uh, as, I rem as I remember for this workshop, I think that, that was a current issue as well. Um, I, don't, I, I don't have that answer for you, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. I, th I do feel that it's an ongoing work, but maybe there's a solution out there and I just don't know about it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I butt in for a moment and say there's places where synthetic data is great. For example, if we make fake data that looks just like patient data that allows you to test and run software code analyses, that's actually made um, your code useful. People can see how it works um, without actually having to reveal any private patient data. I wouldn't expect people to um, draw insights from synthetic data unless someone's done some studies and shown something that, I don't know, doesn't make sense to me yet. That would convince me, but nothing else would. But um, synthetic data by itself is not necessarily bad. I think it depends how it's used. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so just a wrap up a slide basically for you all. Sorry, if... Sarah. Um, That's okay. I am seeing um, after you raised your hand. Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, I've asked that question because uh, it was, I think, like five or five, four months ago. I was taking part in a training about data engineering. And we were using a Python package called Faker to basically create fictitious and synthetic data to, to test an ETL pipeline for the how to extract and, and transform and load the data. And that was the first time that I used that package. And it really creates data that if somebody sees without context that they will we feel that that data is correct and real. It, it generates uh, names, uh, addresses, and everything. So when having an interest in ethical use of AI and responsible AI, that comes to mind in how to deal with such, such data. I think it is very important to disclose, specifically when you use such uh, practices or tools or data that you clearly mentioned that this data is well, synthetic data, it is fake and, and so on. But I, I, yeah, I agree that in these issues are still in their early stages. And sometimes even the practitioners, they don't know the right approach to, to, to deal with it. But yeah, I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you so much. That that I think yeah, that is definitely a real issue. Uh, I think there are ways. Uh, yeah, as you always mentioning in the chat. Uh, yeah, that maybe we just want to make for now. We just want to be careful of not to share fake data or just to be clear about it, as you are commenting as well. Uh, I'm sure there will be other solutions out there, and that people are already working on it. Uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, I don't have more questions for you, more answers for you. Um, but I like that it's coming, creating more questions. That is very sciencey. <laughs>
So yeah, as you can see here, this is just like a wrap up slide. Uh, just encourage you like very simple things that you can do like to be open and use fair principles Um easy things. Like just not, you don't have to go over the moon for certain, for certain things. Just deposit your data where others can find it. Uh, try to make, go, make me use a specific uh, repository that is more popular or more used in your field. Uh, and give it a unique, a stable, unique identifier. Uh, again, make your data and metadata accessible as well uh, with uh, with your data. Uh, explain in detail, as you were just pointing out with the AI, uh, the standards, the context, what is it about. Never assume that people know uh, what is what you're doing. Uh, include information on, on ownership and provenance, even if you're just like reusing the data. Uh, but I want to insist again on use clear license. Uh, if you don't have a license, it really just means you don't, you are not giving others access to reuse your materials. Um, and again, just describe your data in a standardized fashion uh, using some agreed terminology and vocabulary. Uh, try to use prefer an open file format. And again, as uh, you can use this at any point in the process, but it will always be painless or less painful uh, the earlier you start. So yeah, I really encourage you to start at least thinking about how you would do it and then try to implement the different bits that you can. And that's it from me, basically. Um, I just wanted, yeah, as I been mentioning, I think in most of my slides, uh, most of my slides have been like reducing material from other experts, uh, mostly from OLS. Uh, I also have like a list of resources in here. Most of my knowledge experience comes from the Open Seeds OLS community and also the Turing Way. The Turing Way, from those that you don't know, is a community open science book uh, that it is community led, community written. You have tons, tons, tons of resources there in a very late um, vocabulary, like very. It's perfect for beginners, perfect for more advanced users. Uh, you have uh, anything from open science, reproducibility, open software, uh, version control, anything that you can think of open science. I think you can find it there. Um, and yeah, you can even contribute if you think about topics to for contribution. So yeah, that's it from me. Uh, happy to take more questions or discuss more things that I don't know about. <laughs> um, it's been wonderful having you guys around. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, we're gonna wait for a few minutes. Uh, to see if people have questions. You can share that in the chat. You can share that in the notepad. Uh, and so please help me give Sarah a round of applause. Um, I think that was a, a great presentation um, covering a lot of topics in a very, very clear way. So if you have other questions, again, please share that in the chat. And in the meantime, let's try again doing the feedback form. Now that Joe figured why it wasn't working before, I'm gonna share the link again. So we still have 10 minutes in the call. And before we share the closing announcements, please take the next five minutes to share with us uh, what has been your experience so far in the program. We're, we're really, really eager to hear your responses. Yeah. And I do see, I'm going back to the um, notepad and there are some questions there. There is one, for example, that's asking, uh, is it fair to open data or research products for a limited period of time only? I guess if you make it just for a period of time, that wouldn't really count as reusable or persistent. 
um, I guess also it would depend on the on the reason. Yeah, so sometimes we just have a specific period of time to make things open or to publish them, or and then again we just have to delete it. Or um, so I guess you could always say it is fair or open while it is there. Um, yeah, I wouldn't think of a reason why you wouldn't want it there forever. Let's say. Or if that didn't answer your question properly. <laughs> I see a suggestion in the chat of having a session with a speaker with an AI background. Um, that could be a great question, a great comment to share in the feedback forum. Voice included in your answer there. I'm gonna give everyone three more minutes to share your feedback form. And after that, we'll, we'll have a few closing announcements. I put the link to the form in the chat again, and it's also in the notepad on line uh, 169. While you're thinking and typing, I'm gonna distract you and say thank you. It's been really nice um, seeing everyone get really chatty in the etherpads um, and in the Zoom chat. Um, keep it up. It's yeah, it's been an absolute delight. So thanks, folks. Okay, so um, I'm starting to see some answers coming in. And if you haven't finished yet, please um, take uh, the next few minutes to do that. And I'm gonna share just a few announcements. 
Tomorrow on Wednesday, we have office hours. That's just a name we, we call to the space where you can come and ask questions um, to keep discussing um, this uh, topics. If you have updates to share about your projects, also um, that would be the place to come. Um, it's really a very informal um, space. It's at the same time that the training sessions. And then on Thursday, we have the uh, uh, second part of the open data module. Uh, we're gonna dive into some uh, specific topics about data. So hopefully you can join. If not, as always, the, the sessions are recorded and we share the link to the YouTube channel um, a few days after um, when the transcription is fixed and corrected. Um, this week, if you haven't yet um, met with your coach, please try to do so by the end of the week, uh, if that's possible. If not, we understand that people are extremely busy, so try to do that, uh, arrange that as soon as possible. And let us know if you need any help uh, to make that happen, even if you need like a Zoom link uh, to join the meeting with your coach. Um, just let us know. Yeah. And okay, let me see what else I had here. So I think that's it for, for this session. Thank you again for joining. Um, as Joe said, it's been really great seeing all your amazing comments and your, your questions. Um, so yeah, thank you, everyone. I will now stop the recording.